Hello, I'm Matthew Kahn. I'm a professor of economics at USC. And in this brief video, I want to talk about my new book that I can't see on the screen. I'll put this thing down. I'd like to present a few slides to show you uh, some of my thinking and the heart of my new book, Going Remote. Here's my contact information, and here's the title of the book, Going Remote, How the Flexible Work Economy Improves Our Lives and Our Cities. And this book was recently published by the University of California Press. So I'd love to give an informative, fun, and brief book talk about some of the big themes of this book. And I think a unique feature of my book, and it's written for a popular audience, but it also discusses much academic literature, is to focus on the urban transport and environmental economics implications of the rise of remote work. My book is a US focused book, but I think that the ideas in the book uh, generalized to Asia, Africa, Europe, might speak a little bit about that or talk about that on a future podcast. It's important to note that I'm not a reporter. This is not a state of the world in the year 2022. On some level, this book is a piece of science fiction that it's sort of set five years from now, 10 years from now. So in economics, we make the distinction between short-term effects and medium-term and long-term effects. For example, with the recent jump in the price of gas, in the short run, if you own some BMW or some Hummer, you can't immediately slim down and get a Tesla or an electric vehicle. Uh, in the short run, we have fewer adaptation strategies to cope with a change, where a change might be a higher price of gasoline or having the ability to engage in work from home. In the medium term or long run, economists argue that people are more responsive to a change because as time passes, you can change your life in many more ways. In the case of a higher gas price, you can move, you can purchase a car that's more fuel efficient. In the case of work from home, if you are a privileged worker who has the ability to now work from home, once you have that right to work from home, you can choose where to live, how often to go to work, you can adjust your life in many ways. And my book is about the urban and environmental implications of when you do have this new freedom to work from home, either five days a week, or three, four days a week, how does this change your life? How, think of a map, where do you now live your life? Where do you now spend your time when you have this new freedom? And I claim that this individual benefit for those who have the right to work from home, that this unlocks macroeconomic progress for all of us. And so in writing this book, I was been trying, and I wrote this book over the last couple of years, been trying to think about and anticipate the challenges and opportunities for firms, people, and places when we when in our new emerging Zoom economy. And I believe, as the last bullet point says, that there's actually a huge silver lining of the COVID crisis. Work from home is an experience good. So in the past, economists have talked about experience goods. For example, heroin is an experience good. Until you try it, you don't really know what it is. A more benign example is the first Star Wars movie, which uh, Star Wars 4 came out in 1977 when I was 11 years old. And I never would have guessed how much I would enjoy Star Wars movies until I actually saw it. With some goods, you have to experience them to know how much you value them. And I claim that work from home is one of those goods. We always, some of us were working from home, but uh, many, most of us were still going to work five days a week in February, 2020. And then we launched this work from home experiment to adapt to COVID. And we learned how much happier and productive we are when we work from home. And so in this sense, we've run this enormous field experiment that will have persistent benefits for all of us. And I claim that we wouldn't have run this experiment if COVID hadn't occurred. So I don't want anyone tweeting out that Khan thinks that COVID was good. I don't believe that. What I do believe is that we sometimes lack imagination. And when we don't have full imagination about the possibilities out there, until we run an experiment, we don't know what we're missing. 
And in this sense, there's been an enormous silver lining of the COVID horror. Here, mechanically, here are the chapters of my book. The introduction, no going back. Three parts of the book, workers, firms, and places. I then pivot to workers. And as a microeconomist, I'm interested in our diversity. Some of us are young, some of us are middle-aged, some of us are old. Some of us qualify for work from home, some of us don't. Some of us love city life, some of us are rural people. I wanna talk about the short-term gains for work from home workers and the medium-term gains for work from home workers when we can adjust on long more margins, just as I was saying. I then briefly wanna talk about how firms will adapt. How will an Apple or an Amazon or a Tesla remain profitable if it allows more of its workers to work from home? I then want to talk about locations in the United States. I want to talk about superstar cities like New York City, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Boston. I want to talk about other areas, whether it's a Bozeman, Montana or a Santa Barbara, California. I also want to talk about Baltimore, Detroit, Cleveland, post-industrial cities, these Rust Belt cities that have been losing people for decades. I believe, and I argue in the book, that work from home will create new opportunities for those cities and create a new geography of jobs. And so Enrico Moretti wrote that great book about a decade ago about the rise of America's superstar cities. His book is great. Work from home creates new insights for thinking about America's geography, which before the COVID crisis, there was an unfairness to America's geography as I'll talk about next. At the start of my book, I talk about the Apple headquarters. So in this picture, this is not a UFO. This is the Apple headquarters in Silicon Valley. And what you see here is its distinctive shape. And this was only finished in 2017. This thing doesn't have air conditioning. It was built to create this pleasurable environment for working, collaborating, thinking. You can see the green space in the inner perimeter of this spaceship-like thing. When Apple built this, it knew the physical location of this headquarters and using its big data from its administrative data set, it knew where all of its workers lived. Going forward, if, Amazon, if Apple had a choice in three years in 2025, where will Apple's workers live? Will they live 20 miles from this thing? Will they live 80 miles from this thing? Will 10% of them live 600 miles from this headquarters? Will Apple regret having built this thing? Will it be thinking about consolidating this real estate and turning some of this into residential housing? I'm very interested in the allocation of scarce resources like any other economist. Apple made this irreversible investment in this giant spaceship. At the time, it thought this was a profitable investment, but the world has changed. What is now the name? As its workers reoptimize, as Apple reoptimizes and tries to continue to be a very profitable company, what are its best choices going forward? And how does this relate to urban economics? So before March 2020, the United States faced many challenges. We had some great cities, which are still great cities, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Boston, New York. As Ed Glazer, Enrico Moretti, and other urban economists who study agglomeration have argued, we have built these really productive hubs. There's a debate in urban economics for why they're productive. Is it almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that highly educated, ambitious people move to Wall Street, making Wall Street more productive, that in a shelling sense that Wall Street solves a coordination failure? Or is there something intrinsically productive about the place called Wall Street that's just could, could make Forrest Gump a productive person. In truth, I believe that it's a selection effect. That, uh, and I think that David Card and Jesse Rothstein's recent work supports this claim that wherever high-skilled people gather in relatively close physical proximity, th that place is gonna be productive. And in an economy featuring Zoom, there's a question of how physically close together these people need to be. Of course, for people who have not met each other yet, for strangers, face-to-face -face is needed to break the ice, to trust each other, to pick up personal clue, cues. But once people know each other, once you know me face-to-face, uh, -face, we can then work on Zoom together and make progress. Returning to the superstar cities, before the COVID crisis of March, 2020, these cities were highly productive, 
but from the and and had a great consumer city. They tended to have great amenities, natural beauty, green cities, progress on air pollution and water pollution. My father's amazed in New York that you can fish in the local rivers there. This was not true in the 1970s. If you fell into that water, you would have been dissolved. Um, that was a half joke. The second bullet point. America's most productive, most beautiful cities tend to be highly progressive environmentalist cities. An unintended consequence of this ideological worldview is there's very little housing supply in these cities. NIMBYism, not in my backyard, is used, lawsuits are used by homeowning environmentalist communities to block new housing. What this means from Econ 101 is that if there's rising demand to live in a productive, beautiful place. But if it's impossible to build new housing, home prices are going to be incredibly high in the most productive, most beautiful parts. This is going to price out young people. It's going to price out immigrants. And it's going to price out lower middle class people. And this causes sprawl, pushing them out into the periphery. And this means that the, as they try to commute to the city center, they're going to have long commutes, long variable commutes, because we don't have road pricing. Singapore, London, Stockholm, all have road pricing. America's cities have chosen not to build housing and not to implement road pricing, creating real time loss for many American commuters who spend hours on these roads as road warriors. A final point is before March 2020, there was a bundling issue that you, because of the high, com because of commuting, because nobody likes to commute, you had to live close to where you work. There are many people in our diverse society who would, if possible, would want to live somewhere else relative to where they work. So if your dream job is at Phoenix, but you don't like Phoenix, you are torn. There's a bundling issue that you're forced to live in close proximity to your employer who happens to be in Phoenix. In a world of work from home that emerges after March 2020, there's this unbundling. Sherwin Rosen talked about hedonic bundling. A big idea in my book is work from home unbundles place of residence. You only have to be in the office three days a month. You can take some Southwest airline flight from anywhere, uh, whether it's Oregon, Chicago, Baltimore, to get to that Phoenix office with a direct flight. In that sense, work from home and transport infrastructure like airplanes or the Accela corridor, train corridor, Amtrak on the Northeast corridor are compliments. The two themes of my book before I wrap up this podcast today, again, is that work from home unbundles place of residence from place of work. Once we are untethered, where do we go? Ed Glazer and I, about 20 years ago, did a lot of work on suburban sprawl and the benefits to middle class people, the more affordable housing, the access to newer housing, the access to better uh, schooling and more schooling choices, a la Charles Thibault, that are possible when you can work from home. Effectively, what work from home does is it's sort of like a commuting speed. If you only have to go to the office one day a week, it's as if your commute time has fallen by 80%. And this introduces a rebound effect. If your commute speed goes up considerably because, you only, because you're commuting much less, you, there's a question of how you re-optimize. So to say that again, if you only have to go to work one day a week, you might choose to live much further from your place of work because you don't incur that cost twice a day. You only incur it twice a week. And so an obvious urban economics prediction of the rise of work from home is the population decentralizing. And real estate economists, including myself, have documented that we're seeing this. Different people will save different amounts of time. And I talk in my book of how people will spend their new windfall of time, spending more time with their children, being more involved in their community and implications for bowling alone and social capital in their community, worker spouses being better in household production. To be super commuters, if they're home more, doing more of the chores and there being less tension and family inequality as the breadwinner actually contributes at home. 
Now, there will be diversity over the demand to engage in work from home. And Nick Bloom and Steve Davis uh, together are doing great work today, measuring stated, doing these surveys to measure how much people value the opportunity to work from home. I wanna talk about diversity here, diversity over age, leisure tastes, and family responsibilities. To keep this simple and to keep this short, compare my 20-year-old son to me. My 20-year-old son has no urge to engage in work from home. He loves cities, and he's at the start of his career. He wants to make his name. He wants to learn what he's good at. He wants to network, and he wants face-to-face. -face. He wants to be mentored. In contrast, and so he, the young, don't value work from home. They want to be in the middle of the action, just what Ed Glazer celebrates in his triumph of the city. But there's old guys like me at age 56. I'm established, for better or worse, I am what I am, and Everyone knows what I am, and I don't need to be mentored. And I, 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 I'll stop cracking jokes. At my stage, I'm fully formed. People know who I am, and I can use Southwest Airlines or Uber and go to the city when I either want to be in the middle of the action or when I want to mentor some young people. And so work from home accommodates our diversity. Point number two is leisure. In the past, let's go back to that example of Phoenix. If there's some worker whose dream job is in Phoenix, but she loves to ski, there's not a lot of skiing opportunities in Arizona. It's a little hot. Work from home creates these exciting possibilities to live your best leisure life and to locate where you want to be. If you love to play chess, if you love to hike, if you love to surf, if you love to hike mountains, if you love to ski, work from home accommodates this. Family responsibilities. If you have a sick mother in Missouri, can you be working for a New York Wall Street firm at the same time? In the past, no. With work from home, many more possibilities to be a good child, to, to, to care for your aging parent so that you have no regrets about the choices you made in this life. Work In that sense, work from home offers this flexibility that's hard to put a value on. If your child is sick, do you have to go to work that day or can you take care of your child and do your job on the same day? That's priceless. Chicago snowstorms. I am a graduate of the University of Chicago and I've been lectured that Chicago's economy shuts down when it's snowing. I have told my colleagues there that that's baloney. In a work from home economy, the University of Chicago economists get more work done on a snowstorm day because they don't go to the office. These individuals can avoid the ugly winter commute and declare it's a snow day and get more work done at their place, uh, just with some peace and quiet. And so in that sense, work from home is even a climate change adaptation strategy, this ability to re-optimize. Our lives are short. How do we spend our time where we really want to be when each of us has our own conception of the good life? Bottom bullet point. Some testable hypotheses that I discuss in my book is that women will disproportionately gain from the rise of work from home. In many traditional households, women are the primary child caregivers, and many women, highly qualified women, quit the labor force when children are born. With the rise of work from home, this ability to balance being with a young child, but without commuting to work, a fixed cost. Economists know that fixed costs lead to people to be at a corner, to, to, to not work, it, because it, it's crazy to commute three hours round trip to work three hours. You, you, one is much more likely to commute an hour and a half both ways if you then work for eight hours, but there's not enough time in the day if, if you want to also be caring for a child. With work from home, there's the ability to balance both. And firms that anticipate that workers will not opt out and will be involved will invest more in mentoring such individuals. And so I argue in the book that work from home will contribute to closing the gender gap. New opportunities for African-Americans. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, some of America's greatest cities, these tech cities, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Boston, folks, all of these cities unfortunately have the feature that very few African Americans live in these cities. I don't want to explore why that's the case, but that is a fact. Many more African Americans live in cities like Baltimore, Detroit, Cleveland. These cities are cheaper and have greater histories of African American culture. What work from home creates is the possibility for, uh, uh, for 
a highly educated African-American man or woman to live in a Baltimore and then to work for one of these tech companies remotely. So if Amazon opens an HQ2 in Virginia, the ability to have it all, to live in a Baltimore in a place with cheaper housing and with a culture that might be what you're looking for, but to not sacrifice in terms of employers in an economy that didn't have work from home, that faced the bundling constraint, someone who loves Baltimore has to work for a Baltimore firm and that limited their economic opportunities if our great companies are in these tech cities. With the growth of HQ2s and HQ3s, these smaller headquarters, this creates new possibilities and permutations. If you live within 150 miles of one of these entities, you can have it all. Live in an area where you are comfortable and still have access to, to, to the high-flying companies in America and the promotion possibilities there. I think this is very exciting. I wanna live in a country that's fair, and that rewards everyone, where everyone thinks the American dream lives on. The final slide for today. When I've presented my optimistic work to people, some have pushed back saying that work from home is elitist. They are right in one sense. If you are college educated, you are more likely to be working in an industry and occupation that is amenable to work from home. A professor is an obvious example of a work from home worker. A dentist is face to face. A plumber is face to toilet. Uh, you you got to physically show up to, to put that thing in or, or clean it out. What pessimists are missing in this case is the local multiplier effect. And, let, and I'm going to argue that the local multiplier effect creates tremendous opportunities for non-work from home eligible workers. And let me give an example. Suppose that with the rise of work from home, that thousands of people move to Bozeman, Montana because of the ski opportunities and the lifestyle. As these individuals move to this, as these work from home eligible people move to a Bozeman, the aggregate purchasing power that is created creates jobs in construction, plumbing, school teachers, dentists, psychiatry, you create all these service sector jobs in this beautiful place. What America is about is expanding the opportunity, the menu of opportunity. As, as the demand for non-tradable services increases and those workers, whether you're a plumber or a dentist or a teacher who value the amenities in such a place, don't have to live in a San Francisco anymore. They can move to this area, be well matched with their leisure preferences, know that their neighbors have similar tastes. This will help with their friendships, improve their quality of life, improve their mental health. So folks, notice that this book is about the medium term effects of the rise of work from home when our economic geography changes. Mildly interesting. This book is not a bestseller. I don't know why. <laughs>